top of the day to everybody. This is Kendall and this is Intensify here with my cousin Christian. And um, yeah, just for starters, we did face a little bit of adversity just trying to record anything. And honestly, I'm still a little bit unsure about how this is going to sound, but um, I'm rambling and that's because it's nighttime. So I do apologize. But Christian, Hey, how y'all doing? This is my first time here, and uh, I'm really excited about the concepts we're going to go over today. All right, so the first question that I'm going to pose, which really is everything that we are trying to get at in this in this episode, is just, are you going your own way? Um, everything that you're doing in your daily life, are you going your own way, or are you going God's way? Because we do see in Scripture time and time again, um you know the downfall of the nation of israel spiritual israel the downfall of god's people has always been when they decided to go on their own way and um yeah i think there's a lot of ways both major and minor which we can check ourselves on if we're going our own way or if we're going the way um the way of christ and so christian do you have any thoughts or insights or anything to add to just the idea of going your own way no, honestly, I think that was pretty good what you said, you know, are we going our own way or are we going Christ's way? You know, I think that's very important for us to understand. Right on. Well, as we move forward, um, again, we're just going to be looking at different aspects of what this could look like. And the, the first way is spiritual intake. Um, you know, as someone who at one point You know, I wasn't going to church, but I was like, you know, I read my Bible. I spend time with Jesus. Um, I'm good, basically, and not really um, taking into account all the things that I should be actually doing in terms of spiritual intake. And I was really I was leaning on my own understanding. And, and, you know, I mean, you and I would talk about our faith walks at the time. But, you know, there was no church life. There was no community. We really weren't even reading the Bible that much, to be honest with you. So, um, yeah, what do you what do you have to say about just spiritual intake? It may be a time where where, you know, you weren't properly spiritually intaking. I don't even you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, yeah. So I think for me, it's that form of spiritual discipline, right? Like being a new Christian, being a spiritual youngling in the faith. I think the biggest thing for me that was the problem is I had too much pride. Like I had all this, I had all this perceived knowledge of what the gospel gave me. And I thought that I could figure it out on my own by just reading the Bible and not actually surrounding myself with believers and actually taking that step forward. I was very comfortable and content with where I was with the Bible, but eventually you have to step out of that. What was it that was it the the knowledge and in, in the self-proclaimed understanding that is that what made you content or what made you content with where you were at at that time? I think what honestly made me so content is because I still love the fleshly ways of my life, but I still wanted to teeter that line of still having the Bible. So when I had it, I felt really good. But I still wanted to also live for the world. And, you know, the Bible says you can't serve two masters. And I was very content in that moment, but I knew that something had to give. So you were you, there was a combination of going your own way. But, you know, when stuff got real, you knew, OK, no, I need to go God's way. But I would rather go my way Monday to Friday because that's where I was at for sure. And that's what. I'm actively working on, you know, casting that aside and being like, you know, you're all in or you're all out. There's no lukewarmness. There's no one fort, no one fort, one foot in the door of Christ and one foot in the door of the of of the world. And so um, also just like at that time, I was also uh, seeking wisdom and guidance in places that I shouldn't have been. I was really into stoicism. You know, and I was using that as a form of spiritual intake that kind of I was reading. Uh, I had a, I had a, a book on stoicism that I was reading every day and not to say that stoicism is a it's not a it's not a bad practice or it's not it's there. The, the, the philosophies there are good. There's a lot to learn. 
but the more I learned about stoicism and then I looked at my Bible, the things I liked most about stoicism was also in the Bible. And that means it was in the Bible first. Um, but I was basically, I was preaching stoicism, like the gospel. I mean, you were like, I was telling you about stoicism all the time. And I was using that as a substitute for spiritual intake all the time. I was reading that book, which again, it is a, it's a supplement, but I was treating it as the primary form of, of, of spending time that I should have been spending time in the word. And on top of that, I was, and keep in mind, this is about two years ago. And so on top of that, I also, I was entertaining things like angel numbers. I was like, oh, maybe this means, like, I don't know, maybe it connects with the, with the Bible, but there's actually scripture that speaks in the opposite of entertaining someone, something like angel numbers. And I know you and I have both talked about that. So do you have any, like, what do you remember from pulling from things like angel numbers? And, and at one point were you like, nah, bro, this is not true. Cause we both at the same time without speaking to each other about it, we're like something about this is wrong. This is not, this is not of God. This is not God honoring. I think the one thing that people do as new Christians is we like to look for things that we can add to the gospel. Like it's a main dish in Thanksgiving where we could be like, let's add this side and it'll make it better. But you can't water down the gospel or add things. For me, with the angel numbers, what stood out to me that it wasn't right, I tried to use it and look up like Google and be like, oh, this means that I'm going in the right, right direction. But most of the time or sometimes I would fall short of the glory of God or I would be in a terrible mental state and I would see an angel number and I'm trying to figure out how does this mean I'm going in the right direction if I'm in this terrible place. And if anything, it could be so bad to where it affirms you of doing bad and evil things because it's not biblical. Yeah, I I definitely feel that. And I definitely it, it was it was like a comfort food. In, in times of like, oh man, when really all I needed to do was spend time in prayer and spend time in the Bible, I would be like, oh, God's really looking out for me. He sent me these numbers today. Like the Lord rebuked that. That is not, that is not what that was. That, that is not of God. And, and it was you that brought it to my attention that I forgot where um, you read it or came across it, but it was like, you know, you know, we know we serve a God who will come to us in a in a subtle way and like we really have to be still and listen in order to hear it and you were like that's way too obvious and not with humility at all like that is not something that aligns with god's kingdom um and i remember when you said that it was shortly after i came across a scripture and i'm gonna have to look it up i I think it was in romans it might have just been somewhere in the new testament i could definitely be wrong but it was speaking about people worshiping angels back in Paul's Paul's day back in the apostles day and I was like well if they've been doing that since then it's by no surprise that this is something that's kind of trendy now um but yeah I just it's interesting to reflect on that we unknowingly we we were just eating unhealthy spiritual food it was a bad form of spiritual intake and we have to be mindful of it in terms of these things that are like buzzwords, new age. Um, we have to be mindful of it when it comes to the, the pastors we listen to um, or the churches we attend or anything of the sort. However, we choose to spiritually intake. Um, we need to, you know, we need to just keep it simple, believe the gospel and essentially do what scripture tells us to do. Jesus told us to go in our room, shut the door and pray to the father when it's time to pray. Uh, we know we have Jesus as a mediator to the Father. Um, really, we know that we just need to spend time in the Word, and we're going to learn about who God is. We need to surround ourselves with the Christ-centered community, and we're going to learn and gain more understanding about who God is. Um, and yeah, I mean, and also when you think about it, putting anything else on a pedestal or, or placing anything in place of the gospel in terms of spiritual intake is a form of of idol tree like god is very clear about how he, how his how he feels about his people worshiping false gods in in replacing him um in terms of what they choose to 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 do so far as spiritual intake but from there i'm going to kind of pivot to to media because although i mean media can be used as a form of spiritual intake 
um, really is just a form of intake in general, I guess you could say. Um, and that's the music we listen to. That's the things we watch. And um, I know for myself, um, the things that I watch and listen to have changed. I know it's, it's changed in you as well, but it's, it hasn't really been a conscious change. Can you just kind of talk and speak to, you know, a, a year ago, the things Christian listened to and watched versus today, why those things changed and just, yeah, how that even took place. Uh, honestly, I think it comes from like a, a form of complacency. When you start to slowly move towards God, you don't recognize all the baggage that you need to throw away and put at the altar or bring up on the cross to crucify. You know, a year ago, me, myself, I would listen to every once in a while, I find myself listening to music that has extreme profanity that talks about uh, violence or, you know, doesn't really reflect how I see women. And these things, they are a form of spiritual intake because most people are like, well, I'm not actively doing these things. I'm just listening to it. But when you listen to that beat or that catchy tune, it's making you feel some sort of hypeness, some sort of joy. And it's opening you up spiritually when you don't even know it to be susceptible to the message. When you listen to good music, it makes you happy. It makes you want to dance. So sometimes I'll hear this a lot of times at work. People will say, I didn't even listen to the words. I was just listening to the beat. But that's the problem because we don't, we should care about what the words say and then care about the beat. It should actually be the opposite. So I found myself as I slowly transitioned to, I don't want to cuss anymore. I don't want to do the things that are reflective in the music. It, God brought this to my attention to where I would focus on what are these words saying? And that's not what I believe, so I shouldn't listen to it. I shouldn't say these things coming out my mouth. It just comes to be not like a legalistic view. When you get the Holy Spirit in you, it starts to actually change you. And it's like, well, if I love Jesus like I say I do, why would I want to do these things that question my love for him, that, that could possibly put me in separation? Obviously, when you have salvation, there is no separation. But you should also have a healthy fear of God, which means that you understand that there are things that you should not be doing, kind of like a father and a son. Like uh, a son is going to fear his dad if he, you know, hits the neighbor's car or gets a bad grade. You're like, oh, what are my parents going to say? Obviously, the kid doesn't think his father is going to attack him, but it's a healthy fear because that's my father. He watches over me. Of course, I'm fearing because I've done something wrong. And I think that's how it slowly starts to come together whenever we start to move closer to God. We start to slowly understand that this puts me in a bad state with my father and I don't want to be in that state. Uh, that's what I think about media and just all the other things that we've been talking about here. I know Kendall himself, we've had a period where we've been getting rid of uh, looking at certain things in which we should not be looking at. It's easy because the algorithm throws these things in. And I know I just want to ask Kendall, like, I know there were times where you would constantly be scrolling and you just have to snap yourself out of that trance. Yeah, it's actually a crazy, it's a crazy thing to sit and reflect on. Like we don't realize whenever we're mindlessly scrolling to begin with. And then that's what I mean, side tangent, but I think it's cool that a few weeks ago, uh, we had a pastor speak at our church that was like, hey, every time you're mindlessly scrolling, stop and just, you know, maybe open up the Bible instead. Because if we were to add up the amount of time we spend scrolling, looking for really nothing but trouble, like <laughs> whether it be like, you know, you scroll across someone's page and now you're feeling some type of way about what you got going on in your life or somebody who used to be a part of your life and um, now you're just like, man, um, I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what the just spend an extra time um, either dwelling on the past or just dwelling on things that you shouldn't be. And um, that, yeah, there have been several times where I've, like you said, I've had to like, it's not even me snapping myself out of it. It's more of like, I feel convicted that I am, I mean, I, this is just not what I'm supposed to be doing. And there's a, there's something like you, you feel some type of way when you have realized oh, I just burned 20 minutes 
when I could have been literally spending time in the word. Like we all say we don't have enough time to read our Bible, but I promise you, if you if you did the math of how much time you scroll looking for nothing, uh, I, I haven't guilty of this even on, on, on YouTube. It's not just regular social media. Like there are times where I go on YouTube for a specific purpose if I'm hanging out relaxing, but there are times where I go on YouTube for no reason, just to scroll. And that is just a habit that I, that, that as someone growing up with social media and YouTube and all that, that we've developed, especially because it's on our, on our, our phones and such. But if we were to just take that time and refocus it on God, how much better would our, our daily life and our, our spiritual intake be versus getting caught in these, in these mindless scrolls. But it does take a step of action. It takes setting those time limit on, on your apps or just altogether deleting your apps. I know um, Instagram is not on my phone currently. Um, Christian, you, same thing for you. And I just kind of wanted to dig into to what, is it kind of the same process you deleting Instagram? Is that kind of the same um, process that you described with how it's been for like music and overall media uh, when it comes to Instagram or, or is is there anything different about how that's been? This just happened, by the way, like this. This was this week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this was a very new process. I do think that for most people, there's different levels to the attachment. So like if music isn't something that you really listen to all that much, it's not going to be hard for the Holy Spirit to get you to get in accordance with the will of God. So that way you can detach from those music because it was never a strong thing for you. That's where we get to talk about strongholds. The deeper you go down that iceberg and it gets bigger, that's when you start to find the extreme resistance. So for me, when I deleted Instagram, this was where I met extreme resistance because uh, for a while I had apps on my phone, like maybe dating apps. That was easy for me to delete because I knew that those were, you know, they never really worked and uh, they were just bad decisions. So it was easy for me to delete those. Music, uh, it was easy for me to do a switch because, you know, most of the time I did listen to the lyrics. So it was easy for me to just jump over. But when it gets to Instagram and these things that were attached to a level of brokenness in myself, it took a very, a very long time because I, w I would uh, have this level of complacency or contentment to where I would say to myself, or I would have a level of um, justification. That's a better word. I would justify to myself, well, I'm not doing the specific things that are leading me to have a bad spiritual intake. I'm not doing these bad things. I'm looking at friends and family. But when I dug deep into the root of core, the scrolling, the, the algorithm constantly throwing in maybe something that's sexually immoral or something that's uh, bad, like big on profanity or people getting hurt. I would just scroll and laugh at these videos and I would think that it wouldn't have a, uh, I would think that it wouldn't do anything to my mental state of mind. Exactly. I was not thinking that it would do something of this nature, but little by little, that stuff shapes the way you even act. Like think about when you get around with friends and y'all talk about the same videos. Did you see this video? Did you hear this song? The things that are from spiritual intake of media and of music, these things sometimes shape even the very conversations that you have with people. So yes, deleting Instagram took me a very long time to do, but eventually I got to see how, uh, how much dopamine I was relying on getting from that app and how bad of a situation it was putting me in with my relationship with the father there's something that you said that i think of what i really liked in the sense of you mentioning the the people you're around and the things that you talk about and what results from that and the truth is that the tongue speaks life or death scripture is clear there's no in between there's no in between of of the power of our tongue and it speaks about how hard it is to tame the tongue and that we have to give account for all of our empty words and so um in all of our words in general and so it's like and lord forgive me if i'm wrong but it's if the tongue speaks life or death and there's there's no room for error and there's no room for spending time with your friends and people you love i mean obviously you're gonna have just regular conversation but i mean like there's no room for for talking about something that is not god honoring 
and then letting that culminate amongst your group and letting that um whatever the results that may be it is it is it spiritually draining or is it adding are y'all speaking life to one another and um with that before i kind of use that to pivot to the next thing for us to talk about um my screen just turned off just being a little bit candid i needed to see the next point <laughs> but um the question i wanted to ask anyone and everyone is what you're consuming is it edifying is that youtube what video you're watching is it edifying is the music you're listening to is it edifying or are you listening to something sexually immoral something that is profane um, something that is perverse something that is going to you know is going to put you in a bad headspace when I was in high school, I listened to a lot of sad music. My artists, were, my favorite artists were very sad. And when I look back at that time in my life, it was filled with much sadness. But a lot of it was self-inflicted because I was turning to that. I was going my own way and running to these sad artists opposed to spending time in prayer, spending time in my, in my Bible, spending time with the Father. And so, yeah, I just want to pose the question of, is what you're consuming edifying? And the last couple of things we're just going to touch on today is just are when it comes to the relationships in your life we were talking about you know friends and such and the impact that has but when it comes to the relationships in your life um, are you going your own way or are you are you walking the way that jesus instructs us to walk are you surrounding yourself with god honoring uh, god fearing people or are you surrounding yourself with people who are are going their own way which in turn you will go your own way and we've had many conversations just about you know the importance of who you surround yourself with because it's iron sharpens iron we know that right but um has there any been any time in your life recently where you can acknowledge that in a certain relationship or relationships that you are definitely going your own way and not spending time developing a relationship that in hindsight you're like well god would have wanted me to do that one god is sovereign so everything that happens turns out how it's supposed to but i'm just asking have there been relationships where you have to recognize that Oh, yeah, plenty of times. Uh, there's relationships with people who I just found myself not wanting to get close to because somewhere deep down, I understood that this could evolve into something better that would lead me to a better state of mind. But I wasn't in that state of mind of where I could have been a better person. So whenever I found people who were at the same wavelength as me, those were the people I sought out. And you'll start to see it that a lot of the relationships that you have to cut off, you've started to encounter God and he started to raise you up to a level where you have to leave those people behind. And it's not because that, you know, you're better than them, but it's because God is taking you to a different place and you have to get purified. You have to get sanctified. And for me, these situations wasn't that bad. I wasn't always uh, close with people. I was okay with talking to people and reaching out and creating communications because I've always had to do that. But when it came to actually letting someone into my personal space, a piece of me never really trusted people. So I was very hesitant to even build relationships. Now, as I am here, uh, it's the complete opposite. I have relationships that I'm building with people their family, uh, their children, and it's the exact opposite of the place where I was at because I knew somewhere deep down that I was not in the right state of mind to be able to uh, build those relationships in a godly way in which God wanted me to. That's real. That's real. And I, what I think is cool, we talk about it all the time, it's just kind of the contrast that you and I have when it comes to relationships as we've grown up. Um, I was, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite in the sense that I I didn't have trust issues with people in, in a lot of situations I should have, but I was always seeking to be liked more than anything um, to the point to where compromising my faith wasn't, it wasn't easy to just brush under the rug that I believed in Jesus versus, versus a, like just simply defending the faith like we're called to do and so I was always choosing to be liked over to to just take a stand for my faith and which is funny is any time in my life where I've actually took a stood took a stood took a stand for my faith it's never it's never it's actually never repelled that relationship it either exposed that relationship for what it was 
or it strengthened my bond with that person. And so I let that underlying fear was a lie and is a lie for all of us as believers of, oh man, I shouldn't say what I believe right now. I should be passive. I'm not saying you should be aggressive, but you should definitely take a stand. And when it comes to my relationships growing up, I was always seeking to, to be liked. I was seeking to be popular. Um, and so I would rather be in good standing with people than to take a stand on what I believe. And so um, it's interesting to talk about Christian and, and you're in, you know, situations of having trust issues, you know, versus now. And now you're building God honoring relationships, you're planting seeds, you're watering them. And for me, it's just kind of like, well, let me, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed interacting with people, but how can I do so in a God honoring way and not a way that that ultimately honors myself and focuses on myself in making sure I'm in good standing with that person? Because that ultimately, that is me going my own way. I was not going God's way in those relationships. And it's crazy to look back and see how many different opportunities and relationships with people. Um, I mean, going back as far as elementary school, middle school, high school, college, all of it. And I'm like, man, I, there were so many opportunities to honor God, but I chose to honor myself by downplaying the faith, by basically yielding and not really defending the faith at all. And, and again, being more concerned about my standing with with those people versus um, my standing with God, which is really, yeah, it's, it's crazy to think how easy it is to downplay, you know, where do I stand with God right now? I just stop right now and ask yourself, where do I stand with God? Where, how am I in relation to God? Am I going my own way or am I doing the things that he's called me to do? That can be a very scary question, but I, yeah. Where, where do you stand with God right now? And with another pivot here is just when we consider where we stand with God, the biggest portion of it is obedience. Are we walking in obedience or are we going our own way? And obedience doesn't mean doing everything perfectly and getting things right the whole time. But obedience does mean having a sense of reverence for the almighty God who who very well could. I mean, we all deserve judgment. We know that we all have uh, skeletons in our closet. We all have a life of sin that we try to keep tucked away. But God knows. And um, as we get close to wrapping up here, just when it comes to obedience and walking in Christ's way and honoring him, uh, Christian, what what do you just really, what insights do you have to give in terms of, again, walking Christ's way and not walking your own way in the importance of obedience? People hear the word obey, and it kind of stirs something up in them. So what what really, do you, what, what you got to share? I think when it comes to obedience, I think Jesus said it best. I mean, I'm not going to say it verbatim, but he has a parable about how Jesus is the vine and we are connected to Jesus and outside of him we can do nothing good and within him we can and his father is the gardener and those that are not good he basically cuts off of Jesus and they take those branches and they burn them but the people who are still within Jesus the father prunes them so I think when it comes to obedience we have to understand that that's not something that we do it's the it's the something that the Holy Spirit does within us. And true obedience brings peace. True obedience brings true faith. True obedience, we don't think this is a drag. I don't like doing this. True obedience is this is going to get me somewhere better than I am. So I think the true obedience, we have to understand that it's God leading us to a better place, not him trying to harm us. I think far too many times we see the rules in the Bible and some people are like, oh, man this this and this like can i still do this i think when you're a new christian and you're saying can i still do this is this okay i think the mindset is a bit tweaked we need to ask ourselves personally not can i do this but would god want me to do this is this something that i need to be doing for god will this put me in a bad light with god we should be worried about what we should be doing and how it reflects with our relationship not being afraid that we'll lose salvation but understanding that we love god more than the world and we want to go his way not our own way amen and with that um are you going your own way are you walking the wide road that leads to destruction or are you seeking that narrow path that leads to life um, Jesus Christ died for all of us to have a chance at finding that narrow path. 
And I just want to speak that word of encouragement to you. Jesus rose on the third day and he lives at the right hand of the Father and he can transform any of us. Thank you for tuning in. This is Intensify. Share it with someone and we will see you on the next one.